Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. I know you've heard of the six degrees of separation. The idea that every person in the world is connected to every other person in the world through the people we already know. As in, I might know a person who knows a person who knows a person who knows the King of England. It's an interesting thought that even with 7.8 billion people in the world, we are all connected by our relationships with others. An unseen thread that overcomes location, money, and even power. We definitely do not live in a small world. But when we think about the six degrees of separation, the world feels smaller. Today's case covers six people who unknowingly intersected each other's lives. They all lived in Memphis. They all went to the same hospitals, the same grocery stores, the same schools. And in the end, some of their funeral services took place in the same funeral homes. These six people, five victims and one killer, should have stayed separated by their many degrees of separation. They never should have crossed paths, at least not like this. Welcome to episode 196, the 1969 serial killer known as the Cunning Sex Killer, part one. On the evening of Thursday, August 14th of 1969, 21-year-old Mike Dumas planned on having dinner with his new wife, Tanya, and his parents, Roy and Bernalyn. It was a joyful occasion. They were celebrating Tanya's birthday, but Mike's parents didn't show up. This was strange. Mike's parents loved his wife. They thought she was a great fit for Mike, who was doing really well for himself. Recently, he had graduated from a military academy in Missouri. Now he was pursuing his college degree. He had attended the University of Mississippi for a while before continuing his studies at Memphis State University. There, Mike was pledged to Phi Kappa Psi fraternity and work nights in the computer department of the First National Bank. Mike was busy, smart, a go-getter, and so was Tanya. Just a few months prior, in June of 69, Tanya had graduated from business school, where she had been an assistant editor for her university's newspaper. And that same month, Tanya and Mike were married. The wedding was held at St. Louis Catholic Church. Tanya Minor became Tanya Dumas. And Mike's parents could not be happier. Roy and Bernalyn probably loved seeing their only child with such a capable young woman. They wouldn't have missed her birthday dinner for the world. Especially since there was even more to celebrate than Tanya's birthday. Tanya had recently learned that she was pregnant. She and Mike had shared the exciting news with his parents only a few days before the scheduled birthday dinner. Roy and Bernalyn were thrilled to be grandparents. So in a way, this birthday dinner would celebrate two lives, Tanya's and her unborn child's. But dinner time came and went, and Roy and Bernalyn were nowhere to be found. Concerned, Mike called his parents repeatedly. His father, 58-year-old Roy, was a tax consultant who worked from home. And his mother, 47-year-old Bernalyn, always came home from her job as a hospital nurse supervisor at about 3.15 p.m. And in the evening, they were almost always home. But for whatever reason, they were not answering their phone. Where could they have been? Even though Mike was worried, he couldn't check on his parents right away. He had to go to his 7 o'clock night class at Memphis State first. But afterward, Mike headed straight to his parents' apartment. As he approached the apartment building, he could see through the windows that his parents' lights were on and his father's car was parked outside. So he entered the colonial-style building and let himself into his parents' home at about 10 p.m. Up until his wedding that summer, Mike had also lived in this apartment with his parents, so he still had a key. He walked through the living room, but no one was there. Then Mike entered his mother's bedroom, and that's when he saw her, 47-year-old Bernalyn Kelly Dumas. She was bound to her bed by her hands and feet. She was gagged, and she was dead. Someone had strangled her, some sources would indicate, and sexually molested her. And her body had also been badly mutilated with a sharp instrument. It must have been terrible, because the details of this crime scene were never fully revealed to the public, 
even after the killer was caught and on trial. Fire and police director Frank Holloman dubbed the crime scene the most atrocious and revolting double slaying in recent Memphis history. Immediately, Mike fled his parents' home. He pounded on neighboring apartment doors, trying to get someone, anyone, to let him in so he could call the police. But no one would come to the door for a screaming man at 10 o'clock at night. After a while, he realized he was on his own, so he went back into his parents' apartment, called the police, and waited. It wouldn't be until law enforcement arrived that Mike would realize that his father, 58-year-old Roy Kenner Dumas, had been murdered too. Just like Bernalyn, Roy was in his bedroom, tied to the bed, gagged, and strangled. The murder of his parents changed Mike's life forever, and he wasn't the only one affected. The fast-paced city of Memphis, Tennessee stopped in its tracks at the news. And when three more victims were murdered by the same perpetrator over the next 29 days, Memphis became paralyzed with fear. A serial killer was on the loose, and no one, not even your parents, were safe. Hundreds of Memphis citizens adopted large dogs and applied for gun licenses. Door locks and deadbolts were sold out in every department store in Memphis. Everyone was doing everything they could to feel safe, but it wouldn't be enough. No one in Memphis would ever forget August and September of 1969. Not Mike, not Tanya, and certainly not the families of the three victims to come. Bernalyn Kelly was born in April of 1922 to parents Morris and Beatrice Davis in Tennessee. She had one older sister. They grew up in Athens, Tennessee. And in May of 39, Bernalyn graduated from Athens McMinn High School. After graduation, she stayed in her hometown of Athens for a while. There, she attended the Tennessee Wesleyan College. Sometime after that, she made her way to Chattanooga, where she went to the Erlanger Baroness Hospital School of Nursing. And in May of 1943, 21-year-old Bernalyn graduated from there with her nursing credentials. And she had already picked a steady job. In 1943, nurses were in high demand in the United States and across the pond. After all, it was the height of World War II. So Bernalyn served in the Army Nurse Corps. She became a second lieutenant, and she would remain active in Veterans Affairs and related organizations for the rest of her life. By 1951, 29-year-old Bernalyn was back in the state of Tennessee. That year, she began working as a nurse at the Baptist Memorial Hospital in Memphis. Right away, the Baptist Memorial Hospital administrator saw Bernalyn's potential. A year after she had started in 1952, she was promoted to assistant head nurse. By 1957, she was the head nurse. And in 59, Bernalyn also became the nursing supervisor. She oversaw 51 beds and 20 members of the hospital staff. And she'd remained in this esteemed position for the next 10 years. Bernalyn's colleagues remembered her fondly. She was reliable, responsible, and efficient. The director of nursing at Baptist Memorial told the Memphis Press Scimitar that Bernalyn was a person who always wanted to help other people. And others recalled how Bernalyn was a lifelong learner. At age 46, she was taking night classes at the University of Tennessee to earn her bachelor's degree. And at the same time, she wrote book reviews for a local newspaper. Outside of work, Bernalyn was known for her wit and humor. She often joked about her big feet, which were a size 10 and a half. Maybe not the biggest feat in the world, but large enough compared to her slim 5'7 frame. Bernalyn was pretty, with striking hazel eyes and a tailored sense of style. And no matter what life threw at Bernalyn, she never complained. And life threw a lot. In 1953, Bernalyn was attacked and seriously injured during a home invasion by a 20-year-old man named Sullivan Hayes. Sullivan was a prolific thief in the Memphis area. From 1952 to 1954, he robbed 106 houses and nabbed nearly $15,000 in jewelry. That's about $170,000 in today's money. And one of the houses that Sullivan burglarized just so happened to be Bernalyn's. He had watched Bernalyn and her family through the apartment windows. He waited until they had gone to sleep, and then he broke in. Bernalyn must have interrupted Sullivan during the act. Before he fled the scene with her purse with a measly $15 inside it, 
he hit her over the head with a skillet. And she was so severely injured, she had to undergo two major surgeries. And even then, Bernalyn had to start wearing glasses as a result of these injuries. In January of 1954, Sullivan was caught and sentenced to 54 years in prison on nearly 200 counts of burglary and larceny and one count of assault from his encounter with Bernalyn. At the time of the burglary, Bernalyn lived with her husband, Roy Kenner Dumas. Roy had been born in August of 1911 to parents Texas Sifton and Murat in Bald Knob, Arkansas. Roy's family was bigger than Bernalyn's, where she had one sibling, Roy had four, two older brothers, one older sister, and one younger sister. Roy spent a good chunk of his childhood in Bald Knob, Arkansas. That's where his father was born, so it's likely they had family in the area. But by age 19, Roy had moved to Houston, Texas. He never finished high school, but he could read and write just fine, and he found good work as a salesman for a Texas seed company. By 1936, 25-year-old Roy had made his way to Memphis, Tennessee, though he still visited friends and family in Arkansas often, especially when there was a good party. In March of 1942, 30-year-old Roy enlisted in the U.S. Army. He may have been drafted, but regardless, Roy completed his year of basic training in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, and then he was off to serve his country in World War II, just like Bernalyn. Roy remained in the military until December of 1945, three months after Japan surrendered and ended the war. In his three years of service, Roy became a sergeant and a war hero. He had received a presidential citation and additional honors for his service, and he had earned a bronze star from his time in the Pacific. Roy had been badly wounded in battle. A mortar blast had hit him in the torso. As a result, he had to have part of his stomach removed, and thanks to this injury, Roy would always be a very slender man with a myriad of health issues. Throughout the rest of his life, Roy, a 5 foot 10 inch tall man, only weighed about 100 pounds. To be fair, Roy had always been a skinny guy. For reference, at the time that he enlisted, he had weighed 130 pounds. But 100 pounds is shocking. We're not sure when Roy and Bernalyn first met or married, but we do know that on March 26, 1948, They welcomed their first and only child into the world, Michael Eugene Dumas. He would go by Mike. At this time, Roy and Bernalyn lived in St. Louis, Missouri. Bernalyn was a psychiatric nurse at the Barnes Hospital. But shortly after, they would make their way to their final home of Memphis, Tennessee. People thought that Roy and Bernalyn made an excellent couple. They were quiet and respectable, and their son Mike had everything going for him. Bernalyn often spoke of how proud she was of him, and she had reason to be. Though Roy and Bernalyn lived in Tennessee, Mike began attending the Kemper Military School of Boonville, Missouri at age 14. While in school there, he was elected to official positions by his classmates. He was on the Honor Council. He received a special award from the school president for his exceptional responsibility and leadership amongst his classmates. And when 18-year-old Mike graduated in 1966, He was given numerous commencement awards and held the rank of cadet first lieutenant. In the late 1960s, Roy was a self-employed accountant, notary public, and tax examiner. He worked primarily out of his and Bernalyn's home, putting ads in the paper advertising his services. The ads read, Let me do your typing, billing statements, and stenciling at home. A disabled veteran, Roy K. Dumas. But sometimes Roy took on bigger, more exciting projects. Like in July of 1968, when Roy was the finance chairman for Alton L. Arnold's political campaign. Arnold was a Democrat running for state legislature that year, but he lost the election. In 1969, Roy and Bernalyn lived in apartment 3 at 1133 South Cooper in a complex known as the Hermitage Apartments. It wasn't the safest area. Tenants often complained about the lack of security there. There were a fair amount of break-ins, burglaries, and car thefts. But after Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis on April 4th of 68, the landlords finally installed new safety locks on all the apartments. And they even hired a security guard. But the guard only worked at the apartment complex for two weeks during the height of racial tension after King's murder. A neighbor of the Dumases recalled that Bernalyn was very friendly. That same neighbor remarked that Roy was skinny and sick. 
Apparently, he was in and out of hospitals quite a bit. According to Roy and Bernalyn's other neighbors, the couple kept to themselves. They weren't ones to make idle chit-chat in the hallways, and Roy was particularly soft-spoken. But, even if they weren't social butterflies, Roy and Bernalyn had their own interests. They were regulars at the Lindenwood Christian Church, especially at Bible class. The leader of that Bible class told the Memphis Press Scimitar that they were highly thought of. Roy was also the vice commander of the Memphis chapter of the Disabled American Veterans Charity. And similarly, Bernalyn was the vice commander of the Ladies' Auxiliary. August of 1969 probably felt like every other August to Roy and Bernalyn. Some things were good, some things were bad. They were having car trouble, and Roy had to ask the nearby gas station attendant to help him start the damn thing three mornings in a row. And folks saw Bernalyn trucking their laundry to and from the coin-operated laundromat. But perhaps there were a few differences between this August and every other August. Like how, on August 11th, Roy tried to buy a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson pistol. He was refused due to state laws which required a 15-day waiting period. This frustrated Roy. Recently, someone had been robbed at gunpoint near his and Berlin's apartment building. It seems that Roy was trying to take extra precautions to ensure that he and Berlin were safe. But guns and robberies probably weren't on Berlin's mind on Thursday, August 14th of 69. Her colleagues explained that Bernalyn had left Baptist Memorial Hospital in an unusually good mood that day. A close friend and nurse who worked with Bernalyn told the commercial appeal, quote, she was going to a birthday party for her daughter-in-law. She liked her daughter-in-law and had bought her some dress material and something else I can't remember. I waved goodbye to her as she got on the elevator. This friend and coworker may very well have been the last person to see Bernalyn alive as she left the hospital at around 3.15 p.m. At around 10 o'clock that evening, 21-year-old Mike called the police from his parents' apartment to report his mother's murder. When the officers arrived at the crime scene, they encountered a gruesome sight. 47-year-old Bernalyn Kelly Dumas had been strangled and, by some accounts, sexually assaulted. I say some accounts because there is conflicting information regarding whether or not Bernalyn was sexually assaulted. A few days after the murder was discovered, one medical examiner confirmed that yes, Bernalyn had been raped. But years from this moment in 1973, another medical examiner would say that there was no evidence that Bernalyn was raped. The second opinion would be in direct contrast with the first medical examiner and multiple police sources who said she clearly had been. We're not sure why there are opposing opinions here but we do know that her nursing uniform was in disarray. And we also know for certain that Bernalyn had been mutilated sexually with some sort of sharp object. The police suspected scissors, but they never revealed the full details of this mutilation to the public. The assailant had also bound Bernalyn to her bed by her hands and feet using ties, belts, and pantyhose found in the apartment. 58-year-old Roy Dumas was found bound and strangled in his own bedroom. Both Roy and Bernalyn's hands were badly bruised. They probably fought hard against their restraints. Like Bernalyn, Roy was still dressed. He was wearing his street clothes. But unlike Bernalyn, they were not in disarray, and there was no indication that he had been sexually assaulted or mutilated. Based on the evidence, the investigators concluded that the murderer had first attacked and tied up Roy in the early afternoon. Then the killer laid in wait for Bernalyn to get home from work a few hours later. At this point, it was unclear if Roy was already dead by the time Bernalyn walked through the door after her shift at the hospital. Later, court documents would reveal that the perpetrator probably killed Roy after Bernalyn. And while all this was happening, it's likely that some of Roy and Bernalyn's neighbors were lounging at the nearby apartment pool. During police interviews, most of the neighbors said they hadn't heard anything. No screams, no scuffles, no loud thumps. Nothing at all that would indicate that Roy and Bernalyn were being murdered a mere 200 feet away. You won't be surprised to learn that many of these same neighbors moved away shortly after the murders. I know I would have. Right away, the murder of the Dumases was huge news in Memphis. Because of course it was. This wasn't just one murder, it was two. And it happened on a sunny Thursday afternoon, only spitting distance away from other people. 
This case made the front page of big Memphis newspapers day after day, and rumors ran wild. Some police officers believed there was an uncanny resemblance between this double homicide and Sharon Tate's murder. Sharon had been killed only days earlier on August 9th. But others argued that there was far too little blood at this crime scene for it to be the same killer. Plus, this was Memphis, and Sharon Tate had been murdered in Los Angeles. From the beginning, the Memphis police took Roy and Berlin's murders very seriously. Right away, they assigned every available police officer to the case, and they even canceled the Homicide Bureau's vacation days until the murders were solved. That way, they could have all hands on deck to catch the killer. In total, 30 homicide detectives worked around the clock to solve the Dumas' case. But despite this huge investigative effort, law enforcement still had no clue who had killed Roy and Bernalyn or why. But here's what they did know. The Dumas' apartment was clearly robbed. Even though the place wasn't completely destroyed, expensive items and cash were missing. But there was no sign of a forced entry or violent struggle, meaning Roy probably opened the door to the killer when they first arrived. And then the killer caught Roy off guard and quickly incapacitated him, which considering his chronic health issues, isn't surprising. Then the killer was able to hide and attack Bernalyn. When Bernalyn had walked through her own front door, it was too late. She had no idea that her fate had been sealed. Based on the medical examiner's assessment, it's believed that both Roy and Bernalyn were killed before 7 p.m. that night. One day after Mike reported his parents' murders to the police, they brought him into police headquarters for questioning. And Mike was not okay. He hadn't slept for over 24 hours. His eyes were bloodshot, and by many accounts, he was suffering from ongoing emotional shock. Reporters from the Commercial Appeal asked Mike for a comment as he walked into the Homicide Bureau. Mike replied, I'll tell you a comment. I'll tell you one. It's a shame these two people can't live in this world. A few days later, a joint service was held in honor of Roy and Bernalyn at the Memphis Funeral Home. As veterans, they both received a full military funeral, and the husband and wife were buried near each other in the Memphis National Cemetery. On August 18th of 1969, four days after Roy and Bernalyn were killed, the Memphis Press Scimitar published a message to the killer from the Dumas family. The article explained that the family harbored no hatred for the killer who had slain Roy and Bernalyn. Rather, they urged the killer to turn himself in. Their statement read, Whoever brought this terrible tragedy to Memphis and to our beloved ones needs help. It was a terrible thing and a sick act, and we have trained people who can help them. We don't want such a thing to happen again, so we ask the guilty parties to come forward and seek help. If you're like me, you might be wondering if this is a clever ploy by the Dumas family. Lure the killer in with niceties and warm feelings, and then slap the handcuffs on them before they can blink. But who knows, maybe this was the genuine feeling of the Dumas family. Or maybe it was a clever ploy and a genuine message. Either way, the killer didn't respond to the newspaper message, and the Dumas family put up $450 of their own money as a reward for information leading to the conviction of the killer. That's about $3,750 today. On the same day that this statement from the Dumas family came out, August 18th, The police still had zero suspects. They had taken two people into custody, but they were released after questioning. On August 20th, the Memphis Press Scimitar reported that the police were trying to find the midnight burglar who had seriously injured Bernalyn with a skillet 15 years ago. I spoke about him earlier, Sullivan Hayes. Sullivan had been released on parole two years earlier in October of 67. So much for that 54-year sentence, I guess. Since then, the authorities had lost track of him. But the next day, August 21st, the police announced that Sullivan Hayes was not a suspect. But he wasn't not a suspect either. The chief of detectives, Joe Gagliano, said, we're not looking for Hayes any more than anybody else. The police did everything they could. They interviewed families and neighbors. They investigated the scene carefully. They pursued every lead and they packed all potential evidence from the Dumas apartment and sent it to the FBI in Washington, D.C. for analysis. While detectives wouldn't disclose what items they did or didn't send to the FBI, 
they did let slip one small detail, that they had collected and sent so many items from the Dumas home that the line-by-line ledger of cataloging these items filled 3.5 pages, single-spaced. But after a week passed with no meaningful developments in the case, people started losing hope. It really felt like the perpetrator was going to get away with killing Roy and Bernalyn Dumas. This person, whoever they were, had committed the cleanest murders of all time, not because they were especially conniving or calculated, but because they were really freaking lucky. But luck doesn't last forever, not for anyone. On Monday, August 25th of 1969, 11 days after the murders of Roy and Bernalyn Dumas, 82-year-old Layla Picard Witt Jackson was nowhere to be found. Earlier that day, Layla's daughter-in-law had tried to call her, just to chat, but she didn't answer the phone. The daughter-in-law assumed that Layla was on her front porch. She had a nice swinging sofa out there, perfect for enjoying the cooler evenings after the scorching August days. Layla probably couldn't hear the phone ringing while she was outside. But hours passed, and she never returned the call. And when her daughter-in-law called yet again, Layla still didn't pick up. By 6 p.m., Layla's daughter-in-law had a bad feeling about the whole situation, and so did her husband, Reagan. He was Layla's son. Reagan knew his mother hardly ever left her house. She didn't need to. Her house was her business. Layla had converted several of the house's rooms into small apartments. She couldn't stray too far from home because she was a landlord with tenants to take care of, and Layla was getting up there. She was 82 years old. Obviously, she wasn't much for nightlife. She mostly left the house on Sundays to attend the services at the Union Avenue Methodist Church. And even then, Layla's family always took her there. As the sun went down, Reagan and his wife became increasingly worried. If Layla wasn't home, where was she? So the couple sent their son to check on his grandmother, Layla. This was 18-year-old Donald Eugene Jackson. Donald led himself into his grandmother's house. There, he found her lying on her bed. She had been strangled with a nylon stocking. Unlike Roy and Bernalyn, she wasn't bound, but she had been sexually assaulted and mutilated with a butcher knife, just as Bernalyn had been. The nature of this mutilation was so specific and so similar to Bernalyn's experience that the police immediately knew their killer had struck again. Layla had been born in October of 1886 in Alton, Illinois, to her mother, whose name is unknown, and her father, Charles Witt. Although Layla spent a portion of her childhood in Hedick, Illinois, Layla's family was well-known in Alton, the city where she was born. In fact, Layla's paternal grandparents were community pillars in Alton, and Layla frequently made the 40-mile trek from Hedick to Alton to visit them. Eventually, Layla and her parents moved to Alton, In May of 1908, Layla graduated from Alton High School. Shortly after graduating, Layla moved to Brinkley, Arkansas, and on December 24, 1908, 21-year-old Layla married Charles R. Jackson. Charles was an optometrist from Franklin, Texas. Layla and Charles moved to Memphis, Tennessee, where they had one son. His name was Reagan W. Jackson. Reagan would go on to have two sons of his own, William and Donald. The younger grandson, Donald, was the one who discovered Layla's body. By 1944, Layla and Charles had moved into a big four-bedroom home in Memphis. And in 1956, Layla's husband, Charles, passed away. About 10 years later, Layla decided she was tired of being alone in her big Memphis home. She had all this space she wasn't using, and her place was nice enough. She kept vintage photos of World War II men in uniform above the TV. She had bookshelves lining her hallway walls. And for a pop of color, Layla put fake red carnations atop those bookshelves. It was a nice home, and big enough for more than just Layla. So 80-something Layla put a sign on her yard advertising three vacant rooms, and she took on several tenants. A neighbor who spoke with a commercial appeal stated that Layla was careful about who she rented to. She told people that she preferred to rent to ladies, especially since they all shared one bathroom. And Layla's White House was very close to Memphis's hospital complex. The Memphis Veterans Hospital and Baptist Memorial Hospital 
where Bernalyn happened to work, were very close by. It usually worked out that Layla's tenants were folks who needed to stay close to sick family members who were staying in those hospitals. This location was handy for them, and it was handy for Layla too. She'd also been in and out of hospitals for a while, and especially since her stroke, which had happened sometime in the late 1960s. While recovering from her stroke, Layla had to stay in the Baptist Memorial Hospital for around seven months. There's a good chance Layla and Bernalyn passed each other in the hospital hallways. About two weeks earlier, before Layla or the Dumases were murdered, Layla was getting her hair done at the salon, and the salon owner, Rufus Denton, remembered Layla coming in. He told the Memphis Press Scimitar, she was a really sweet lady. He also explained that he and Layla had spoken at length about Memphis's robbery problem. Rufus said, I had had some things taken, and she said that would never happen to her because she never kept money at her house. I remember she always paid us by check. But tragically, it did happen to her. And as soon as law enforcement was aware of Layla's case, Police Chief Henry Lux and Fire and Department Director Frank Holloman were there. They recognized the killer's M.O. immediately. The day after Layla's death, the Memphis Scimitar headline read, Woman, 82, found strangled in home. She's the third victim here in 11 days. In this same Memphis Press Scimitar article, Fire and Police Director Holloman gave the following quote, Right now, I have 600,000 people interested in seeing these murders solved. Anything I might say at this point could only hurt the investigation. I can only urge Memphians to take every possible precaution to safeguard themselves and their homes. We have had three unsolved murders within the last few days, and yes, we are concerned. That same day, about 100 people gathered outside Layla's home. Many of them were workers at the nearby medical clinics and small businesses. Most of them had seen Layla. She liked to walk around the neighborhood. Those who knew Layla personally spoke of her fondly. One friend told the commercial appeal that Layla was a right good soul. Another said Layla liked to keep her place tidy and was a nice, quiet woman. And yet another said that Layla always went out of her way to be friendly. The next day, on August 27th, Layla's funeral service was held at the Memphis Funeral Home on Union. She was buried next to her late husband, Charles, in the Forest Hill Cemetery in Memphis. As soon as Memphis investigators were sure that they had a serial killer on their hands, they were far more tight-lipped. With the Dumas' murders, law enforcement had shared almost every detail with the press. Now they knew they would have to hold evidence closer to their chest if they wanted to successfully convict the killer. If it were up to the police, the press wouldn't have even known that Layla was strangled with pantyhose. But some of Layla's neighbors and tenants had already spotted the crime scene by the time the police had arrived. Since the police weren't sharing anything this time around, the rumor mill was turning faster than ever. For example, early on the media published that Layla's body was found by her front door. As it turns out, that was just a pile of sheets near the door, not Layla's body. A tenant had dropped them there, maybe after inadvertently seeing the crime scene. And then there was one neighbor who claimed she saw menacing window shadows in Layla's home around 6.30 p.m. She also told reporters that there was a beige sedan with no driver and three men sitting inside of it outside Layla's house. That same neighbor said that she saw a silhouette of a person against her apartment's front window. When she screamed, that unknown person ran away. Suddenly, Memphis was a hotbed of suspicion. Every unknown person was a potential killer. People wouldn't unchain their doors for journalists, salesmen, and even police officers. Speaking of the police, Layla's murder and the confirmation that there was a serial killer on the loose was a nightmare for Memphis authorities. Everyone in the city was terrified, and it didn't feel like the police could save them. But in all fairness to the Memphis law enforcement, they were trying. They increased the number of homicide detectives on the case from 30 to about 40. Fire and Police Director Holloman also reassured the public that these homicide detectives were handpicked for their special talents, and that they all had previous experience investigating homicides. The Memphis Homicide Division offices became a temporary hub dedicated solely to this investigation. They had to bring in so many extra desks that visitors were forced to use a different entrance to the police headquarters. 
Holloman also asked the public to, quote, have confidence in their police department. He explained, we are working around the clock to solve this murder, and we solicit the aid of any person who might have information about this killing. Back at the crime scene, the detectives working on Layla's case quickly realized that, just like the Dumases, her home had been robbed. But also like the Dumases, Layla's place wasn't ransacked, that someone had filtered through her items to look for valuables. Clearly, this methodical pattern of burglarizing without damaging the home was a consistent pattern for the perpetrator. Three days after Layla's murder on August 28th, several suspects had been questioned by the authorities, but none ended up being involved in the case. The police chased lead after lead, phone call after phone call, but none panned out in any sort of productive way. On August 29th, some thought the killer had struck for a third time. 31-year-old Rachel Moore was headed home from her job at a piano bar. As she exited her car at about 1.30 a.m., she was attacked. The assailant was a white man, and he had tried to strangle her with stockings. Rachel only escaped when she stabbed the guy with a nail file. But Chief of Detectives Joe Gagliano was certain that this was not the serial killer they were searching for. And that might have been because around the same time that Rachel was fighting off her attacker, the killer responsible for Layla, Roy, and Bernalyn's deaths had found his next victim. Glenda Sue Harden was born in October of 1947 to parents Charles Henry and Eva Louise. She had one sister who was about a year or two older. According to my research, Glenda Sue lived in Memphis at age two, so it's probable she was born and raised in the area, though she did have some family in Kentucky. Glenda Sue was a sweet, outgoing, and beloved little girl, and she grew up to be a charming, witty, and friendly young woman. At her core, Glenda Sue was a polite rule follower who loved people, the kind of person who always waved at her neighbors and said hello, even when she was in a rush. Her family recalled that Glenda Sue didn't know what it was to be unkind to others. As Glenda was growing up, her parents divorced. Her mother remarried to a man named Harold H. Lee, and Glenda gained a sister and brother in the process. Based on how Glenda Sue's relatives spoke about her, it's safe to assume that they were a very close family. For example, her stepfather, Harold, told the commercial appeal, she was a wonderful girl who deeply loved her parents and everyone around her. Whenever she wasn't at work or at home with us, she was at the church. And it's true, Glenda Sue was a devout Christian. The pastor of Glenda Sue's Baptist church said she was a fine, gentle person. In 1965, 17-year-old Glenda Sue graduated from Kingsbury High School in Memphis. After that, she worked for the South Central Bell Telephone Company. She was a directory assistance operator. But in 1968, Glenda Sue decided to become a secretary. She was hired at the Jackson Life Insurance Company and worked there for about a year. By August of 1969, 21-year-old Glenda Sue still lived with her mother, stepfather, and sister. But she probably wasn't going to live there much longer because she had recently become engaged to a man named Ronnie Sandlin of Ripley, Tennessee. They were going to announce their engagement in September, and the young couple was to be married that January. Glenda Sue probably would have been a beautiful bride. All of the papers made a point of mentioning just how gorgeous she was, with long auburn hair and big doe eyes. At about 5 p.m. on Friday, August 29th, Glenda Sue finished up her work week at the insurance office. Once she had filed her forms and tidied up her desk, she walked out the door. She had told a co-worker that she was going to Sears on her way home, and then she and Ronnie had planned to date. Glenda headed toward the city promenade parking lot, which was located near the riverfront close to Confederate Park. It was where she always parked. Glenda Sue wore a gold dress, black shoes, and a purse. In that purse was her last two weeks' pay, $140. That's 1166 in today's money. Glenda Sue had every intention of hopping in her light blue 1965 Mustang so she could drop by Sears and swing by her house before that date with Ronnie. But it's unclear what happened as Glenda Sue reached her car because she had vanished. That evening, her mother and stepfather were frantic. She hadn't arrived home at her usual time, and that was very out of character for her. In the words of her great aunt, Glenda Sue had both feet on the ground. She was sensible and dependable, 
she would have told her parents if she was going to be out late. And since Glenda Sue hadn't said anything of the sort, her family knew to be worried. A few hours later, her mother and stepfather reported her missing to the police. And around 5 a.m. the next morning, the authorities discovered Glenda Sue's car. It was abandoned in a different parking lot near the riverfront. Her purse, car keys, and shoes were inside the vehicle. Her payday cash was gone, and there were signs of foul play. Immediately, the search for Glenda Sue began. At dawn, over 65 police officers combed the nearby park. They worked the area in a line, standing shoulder to shoulder. They used metal detectors and other equipment to search for any sign of Glenda Sue. Meanwhile, additional officers dismantled the interior of her car. They were looking for anything and everything that could point them in the direction of Glenda Sue or her attacker. At 4.10 p.m. on Saturday, August 30th, less than 24 hours after 21-year-old Glenda Sue had vanished, the police found her body. She was about 30 yards away from the trail in Riverside Park. She had been strangled, raped, and stabbed 14 times in the chest and sexually mutilated. Her hands had been tied behind her back with a nylon stocking, and her body was positioned face down. Glenda Sue Harden's funeral was held at 2.30 p.m. on September 2, 1969, at the Memphis Funeral Home. She was buried in the Memorial Park Cemetery. More than 200 people attended. It was a sad, cloudy, drizzly day. Initially, authorities and the public weren't certain that Glenda's killer was the same person who killed Roy, Bernalyn, and Layla. After all, Glenda Sue was decades younger than the other female victims. And the location was different. She wasn't found in her bed in her home. But Fire and Police Director Holloman told journalists that the authorities were sure that this was the same cunning sex killer. A brief sidebar. Over the course of the investigation, Memphis newspapers would continually use the moniker cunning sex killer to refer to this murderer. He's not cunning, he's an asshole. But just so you don't think I'm rewriting history, the papers of the time leaned into that title hard. It was only now, after Glenda Sue's death, that the police confirmed that the killer's sexual mutilation was his calling card. The Memphis Press Scimitar called it a peculiar type of perverted sex play. And since the police had never released the details of this sex play to the public, only the killer would be able to replicate it. The crime couldn't have been committed by a copycat killer. But there may have been more commonalities between each murder. It's not clear. Police Chief Lux told the Commercial Appeal, there are strong similarities in all four slayings, but I'm not going to tell you what those similarities are. Regardless, it was official. Glenda Sue was the fourth person to be murdered by the same killer in 17 days. No one was safe. Not old people, not young people, not men, and certainly not women. Now more than ever, the citizens of Memphis were terrified. In the wake of Glenda Sue's death, people stopped leaving their houses at night. One police official told the commercial appeal, you could have shot a cannon down Main Street yesterday evening, and it might not have hit anyone which was ironic because the killer had killed all four of his victims in broad daylight. The pressure on the authorities to catch the unknown killer was through the roof. This was, according to the Memphis Press Scimitar, one of the biggest and most intensive manhunts in history. Police Chief Lux told the papers that they had 100 extra police officers on duty at all times. They had reassigned extra detectives from other bureaus to their homicide division. And there were so many officers in the police headquarters building that they were doubled up at desks. And the extra manpower did help. They literally searched the park where Glenda Sue's body was inch by inch. But it's unclear if they found any evidence there. Police Chief Lux sarcastically told reporters, We unearthed a number of tin cans buried as far as six inches under the soil. We found a snake and a turtle. And the reporters also sarcastically published Lux's unhelpful quote. But the police weren't being jerks. Well, at least not all the time. They were trying to look out for everyone. Authorities urged Memphians to keep their doors and windows locked. They told them not to let strangers into their home. And they urged everyone to travel with others at all times. They instructed people to not hitchhike and to not pick up hitchhikers. And they reminded everyone to always lock their car doors. They were so serious about that last one 
that they even conducted a locked door test in the parking lot where Glenda Sue's Mustang had been originally parked. The police announced in the papers that they found out of 200 cars, 15 of them had been left unlocked and vulnerable. The authorities' determination to have people lock their car doors made some wonder if the killer had laid in wait in Glenda Sue's back seat because perhaps she had left her car unlocked, but these theories were never confirmed. Days after Glenda Sue's murder, the police had no suspects and no good leads. They had taken in two people for questioning, but both were soon released. On September 2nd, an anonymous friend of law enforcement donated $5,000 for reward money, and the city council matched that donation. Shortly after, Tennessee Governor Buford Ellington donated an additional 10000 Now the reward for information leading to the capture and conviction of this elusive serial killer was a whopping twenty grand. Today, that would be over $166,000. Needless to say, the police had to get a P.O. box, a dedicated phone line, and 14 new phones to their offices for the hundreds and hundreds of tips that came in. And even though this was exactly what the police needed to solve the case, the amount of intel they received was overwhelming. Here's just a few examples of the tips they received, all of which could have been the killer. A 22-year-old woman at J.C. Penney store in Poplar Plaza was attacked by a man on a stairway. She described her assailant as being in his early 20s with a light shirt, dark trousers, and sunglasses. He was never found. Another woman reported that she saw a young man in a blood-soaked shirt running around Memphis on September 2nd. He was never found either. Another woman heard a noise by a window and she found a man cutting a hole in her screen. As he fled the scene, he dropped a pair of nylon stockings. Just like the others, he was never found. Many, many stories like this came in through the tip lines and it was impossible to know which ones were going to lead to a big break in the case. Detective Chief Gagliano told the Memphis Press Scimitar that we've got a million things to do. We never know when we pick up the phone whether it will be an important tip, the one that will be the key. Police exhausted every possible investigative avenue. They interrogated Glenda's co-workers, friends, and family. They wrote down the license plate numbers of every car parked in the area where Glenda Sue's car was recovered. They tracked down the drivers for those vehicles for questioning. They published pictures of Glenda Sue's Mustang in the papers, asking the public if they had seen this car in the hours that Glenda Sue was missing. They sent every shred of evidence they found to the FBI's offices in D.C. They checked the personnel records of businesses near the locations of the crimes, including the Baptist Hospital where Bernalyn had worked and Layla had been treated. The police were so incredibly preoccupied with this case that everything else went to the wayside. It took officers 30 minutes to arrive at the scene of car accidents. And they even started revealing more information to the public. On September 3rd, the authorities confirmed what the public had been suspicious of all along. All three victims before Glenda Sue had been strangled with stockings. Glenda Sue, on the other hand, had died from her stab wounds, not strangulation. But police did not confirm if she had been strangled with a stocking too, even if it wasn't her cause of death. But by September 6th, a week after Glenda Sue's murder, the fervor began dying down. Law enforcement had 100 homicide detectives and 35 vice squad officers on the case. They were working 12-hour shifts and working insane amounts of overtime. They had increased the number of patrol cars from 17 to 41. They had interviewed approximately 2,000 people and arrested numerous night prowlers, sexual deviants, as they called them, and other generally suspicious men. But still, nothing. Not one of these people was the serial killer they were searching for. As it turns out, none of these efforts were going to lead the police to their perpetrator. They were not hot on the killer's trail. They were not this close to catching him. They were light years away. And the only reason they did catch him? It was the bravery of the killer's final victim, 59-year-old Mary Christine Pickens. And I'll tell you all about her courage and badassery next week in part two of this case. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by Andrea Marshbank. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. 
Today's episode was edited and mixed by Brandon Chuck Snyder of Southern Gothic and Erica Kelly. Today's episode was suggested by Kelly and a few others. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the Listener Suggestion tab. This is the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messaging. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern Fried, but all kinds, but it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review. I'm also on all large platforms like iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, Amazon, and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.